Well, with that, I guess I will shut up and uh, welcome Jeff up here. So, welcome, Jeff. Thanks, thanks. Uh, so we're in a time of year where people are starting to think about wishing. Uh, you all have kids or grandkids, I'm sure, are wishing for things for Christmas. Um, we're all wishing uh, for good jobs for our children and grandchildren as well. Um, we just went through a political campaign where a lot of that was promised. Um, so today I'm going to be talking a, a lot about jobs of the future and whether those wishes can be granted or exactly what kind of wishes are going to be granted. I start out with this quote. It's an old quote and kind of, uh, kind of uh, hard to find, but it says, destiny has two ways of crushing us, by refusing our wishes or by fulfilling them. Here's something else for Christmas. I'm sure you both are dealing with these companies, Amazon.com and Walmart. Um, they give you either a very convenient way to get gifts or um, a very uh, cost-effective way to get gifts. Um, Amazon has done wonders in the last 10, 15 years, making recommendation engines and efficiently delivering packages to our houses almost before we know we want the product. It seems like they get there before we know we want it. Um, Walmart, on the other hand, has used technology to improve supply chains and has radically decreased the cost of, of goods for, for everyone. Because of that, um, Americans are now quite used to getting exactly what they want paying as little as possible to get it, um, and they want it now. They have high expectations. They want everything fast and cheap. Consumers have a preoccupation with speed, cost, and efficiency, and it's naturally been transferred to almost every aspect of our service-dominated economy. Um, you see that in insurance. Almost everything's going online. Almost everything has um, call center, immediate turnaround, anyone that's working in, in a paper and, and pen type of fashion is, is going out of business. So everything's getting faster and faster, more and more efficient. Now parents, of course, transfer the same expectation to the hopes they have for their children. Um, in many senses, when they do that, those hopes for their children become needs. They, they, they feel that they need the, the best and the, the cheapest education for their children. Um, they think that technology should and can be leveraged to provide our children with a world-class education at a reasonable cost. Now there's a contradiction to this, of course, because what we're being told by almost everyone in education is that the cost of educating our children is getting more and more, not less and less. Um, our children are falling behind those of other nations. Um, we fear that our children will be no better off than we were. Um, our children are not being prepared for the jobs of the future. That's what we're all being told we have to do. We need to revamp education so they're prepared for the jobs of the future. And even in this economy, um, we really fear that they may not be able to find gainful employment at all upon graduation from high school or college. The solution, of course, that's being proposed is basically to arm students with laptops and iPods doled out by various computer or various school systems. Um, standardized assessments will now be taken on touchscreen devices, making everything seem much more modern and efficient. Um, there's personalized learning environments, efficient classrooms, and we're using big data, um, mounds and mounds of data and data mining techniques to deliver children that are ready to work in these jobs of the future. And it's about time, really. Um, we're ready for our wishes to be granted. Um, add to that the bonus of a technology that promises to weed out the bad teachers and reward the good. And all of us parents and grandparents, we're sold, um, right along with any taxpayers. And most of us are even willing to buy onto Common Core standards. Um, we think that uh, that'll streamline education. And we say, absolutely. If that'll make education more efficient and drive down the cost, sign us up. That's what we heard down at the Capitol. But be careful what you wish for. There's a downside to these future jobs. And what most people don't know, I'll, I'm going to take Amazon and Walmart as an example, is what it's like to work there. For all the amazing things they deliver to you, working at both of these places is, is very tough. Um, for instance, at Walmart, they have, a, have had a computer system in place for the last 15 years called Task Manager. Um, employees, one of their millions, of, a couple of million employees, swipe their card every morning when they get to work, and they're given a task broken down in 15-minute increments about exactly what they're to do during the day. Um, and they're actually log what they do while they do it, 
and they're monitored about how efficient they are in completing those tasks. If they fall behind, um, the task manager singles out employees who miss their target times for coachings, which are actually spoken reprimands, or else something they call D-days, which are essentially a, a decision-making day where employees need to explain why they should not be fired. This happens with pretty, reg pretty much regularity at Walmart. It's a daily occurrence that these things happen. And there's a fairly large turnover. Um, this allows Walmart to consistently ratchet up the pressure on its employees to produce. Similarly at Amazon, Amazon employees labor under an impressive state-of-the-art computer business system. It tracks minute by minute their movements and performance, literally their movements and performance. The warehouse workers and all the Amazon warehouses are equipped with GPS devices and are actually monitored as to whether they're using the most efficient route through the, the warehouse to get the packages, bring them back to the packaging station, and, and uh, package them for you. Um, Amazon scientific managers have determined through time and motion studies the one best way to perform each task, and the computer business system ensures that employees conform to these tasks precisely. Okay? And if they don't, they're replaced. This is done worldwide. It's done in the United States as well as all their other offices around the world. Um, Amazon, like I said, tags its employees with personal satellite navigation computers that tell employees the exact path they must take to shelve or retrieve items. And uh, these computers also set target times for trips through the warehouse and record whether or not these target times are met. In general, a computer business system, and these are being used in businesses of all types, uh, large businesses now, and even medium-sized businesses across the country, does the following. It provides control and monitoring of businesses and their employees, facilitates the ability to mine giant data warehouses in order to compare performance against historical patterns, and it incorporates expert systems that simulate human intelligence, thereby replacing the cognitive tasks important to the business, essentially even replacing someone's manager with a computer. Okay. So, in order to produce students ready for jobs of the future, teachers and school administrators are increasingly subject to the same high-stakes scrutiny that employees at Walmart and Amazon endure. I want you to think about that. A lot of times we bash uh, teachers, because um, maybe we don't like unions, or maybe we don't like some aspect of teachers, but teachers are under this kind of surveillance today. They have daily feedback about how their children are learning through formative assessments. They get daily reprimands if they're not meeting their peers with respect to those. And their jobs and, and, uh, and pay is on the line based on how well their students do. Um, the benchmarking for success uh, is a report put out by the Department of Education. And it's a report It calls for the adoption of Common Core Standards. That's what it's most famous for. But it also calls for holding schools and systems accountable through monitoring interventions and support to ensure consistently high performance. And this is what's behind, for instance, the accountability law that's going to be uh, in the legislature uh, this session. This is why states are doing these accountability laws, because the Department of Education wants them. They think that the state should hold schools responsible, not parents. And it's because of this benchmarking for success report. Um, you also may have heard of value-added measures. These are what actually judge the teachers these days. Um, it, it's a combination of uh, monitoring their children's classroom, uh, their children's test results, as well as how well the teachers conform to exemplar lessons in class. They, they, they want them teaching a certain way. They want their students learning a certain way. And if they don't do that, their measure get, gets lower and they can get docked in pay, not promoted, or let go. So it pays to conform because their compensation and retention is tied to it. The interventions and support that are, are talked about in accountability laws here in the state and at, in the benchmarking for success document bear striking similarity to Walmart's coachings and D-days. Um, teachers, because of the, the online nature that, that Common Core and a lot of the assessments have, there's almost continuous telemetry about um, how their students are doing. So on an hour-by-hour -hour basis, a principal or a uh, district superintendent or a state superintendent or even the Department of Education can monitor how well teachers are doing with respect to each other or in an absolute way and make judgments about them and rank them. Um, and even principals are judged based on their teachers. And I'll tell you this, this is a shocking thing. 
Um, even tenured professors at universities are judged today um, based on how well their students, who have become teachers, are doing with the assessments of their students. So it kind of jumps a whole generation of teachers, and they're being judged all the way up at the university level. Perhaps not receiving tenure, perhaps not receiving positions at the university because they're failing to meet those needs. They want absolute conformity, not just at the teaching level, but at the teaching of the teacher level. You see this in the state, too, and we're quite proud of it. In fact, Scott Walker's quite proud of it, and most people in education are quite proud of it, are these letter grades we're giving to, to schools these days. Um, we're grading them A, B, C, things like that. Um, so the performance on assessments is aligned to the Common Core state standards, and that creates single letter grades that indicate whether teachers, schools, and districts measure up. If they don't, accountability laws are um, providing sanctions to guarantee um, that those schools are either changed or shut down. Now, letter grades are kind of problematic because letter grade kind of tells you something. I'm not going to really read through that. I guess it comes through kind of small. But what a letter grade does is kind of insidious. You have a, you have a basic knowledge of what an A is and a B. Like an A, well, that's pretty good. Okay, my school district has an A. But if your school district has a B or a C, well, you think they're deficient. And there's an implicit understanding of yours that it's their fault, OK? That it's their fault. Um, so a teacher, if they receive a poor grade, most people assume that the teacher is the problem, and they don't look for other factors. For example, a system in which the teacher must operate. You could have a very good teacher, for instance, move, going into the inner city of Milwaukee or into Chicago or something, and really not having the materials to work with, still making a boost, but still coming out looking poor. Okay, so a, let, a simple letter grade doesn't work. You could have a school, for instance, in a, in a rural area, um, not have the equipment or facilities that, they, that they, other schools have and do more poorly than, uh, than other schools in more affluent areas. And it, it's, not, it's not really fair to judge and put that letter on a, te on a teacher or on a school. But when we do that, that's what people think. That's immediately what you think. So common standards permit school districts and uh, schools and even states to be monitored and compared and corrected. That's their purpose. Um, so I want to talk just a little bit about something called Taylorism. This is, you could, this is a big subject, but I just, this, is, this is sort of underlying this whole notion. It was invented by a guy named uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor, and he named it after himself. <laughs> Um, he says, what he demands of the worker is not to produce any longer of his own initiative, but to execute punctilious, punctiliously the orders uh, given down from their, to their minutest detail. So what he believed is that you could gather all the relevant information about how to do a particular job and analyze it with engineers or efficiency experts, essentially, to determine the best way for things to be done. And then instruct and incentivize your workers to conform precisely to those ways of doing things, and everything would go swimmingly. This, of course, um, has a couple effects. One is that workers become replaceable. Okay, if everyone does the same thing and you can train someone in a day or a couple days to, to do this work, well, you can get rid of that worker and replace them with someone else who can do the same thing. Um, so the end result is that of this operational and organizational shift was to give management much more control over how work gets done. Um, now, the, the big example of, you know, that we're all given in history classes about the success of Taylorism is actually the assembly line. And usually it's presented in terms of Henry Ford and that that was a, you know, a major advance. And it was. It did cause a lot of efficiency um, and, and, and really gave rise to, to the Industrial Revolution but it also made workers more expendable than they were before when they were craftsmen. This was applied a long time ago to education. So this is really nothing new that we're trying right now. This was done at the turn of the last century by a man named Franklin Bobbitt. He published Elimination of Waste in Education, and he argued that Taylor's ideas were directly applicable to primary and secondary education, that you could look at what teachers did write it down specifically the one best way to do it, and then incentivize and, and make them conform to that way. Um, he said, uh, he asserted that uh, the, 
he wanted to create a thoroughly modern school plant equipped with every modern necessity, then operated according to recently developed principles of scientific management so as to get the maximum of service from a school plant and teaching staff of minimum size. He also was the first to really widely adopt standardized testing, um, but today this vision is much more fully um, realized because now we have cross-state conformity ensured by state seating authority to these consortia, the NGA and the CCSSO under Common Core, to essentially give the same test across the country so that we, we now don't have to compare apples to oranges, we can actually compare everyone to each other. Um, the assembly line, like under Henry Ford, did something that's called technical control. They'd lay out the plant in a certain way, and, and certain operations got done at certain stages, and the layout sort of made sure that things were done in that order. So whatever the efficiency experts said was the way to do it, they'd lay out the plant so that was really the only way it could be done. Um, that's actually, in education, has been replaced by the scripted curricula. You may have all heard about like the exemplar lessons in the Common Core, pages and pages of them, that teachers are strongly encouraged to use because they're going to be judged on, on how well they conform to it and how well their students do on tests of similar material. And performance metrics uh, are tied to the aligned assessments. So those actually provide a technical control. Having those tests in place, being judged based on how well you conform to lessons, are exactly analogous to how you lay out a plant. They're, they are an enforcement mechanism by which uh, teachers are made to do things in a certain way. Common core line tests serve as a tool for marking deviance from a standardized norm. That's what it, kind of all tests do. And they, these do in particular. Um, they distinguish winners from losers, and they actually serve, I want you to think about this, it's a little different way of thinking about these tests. They are a surveillance tool, okay? They are a way for a central authority to understand exactly what's going on with students at every point during the day. On these formative assessments and summative assessments, they're getting feedback both on um, affective things about how kids think and also what they know on a regular basis. And, and that's being served back into a central repository. Um, students either pass and fail, teachers meet expectations or fall short, um, policymakers can efficiently monitor this education production, and they can single out for further analysis any action uh, and action any students or teachers that are outside the norm. So they can find people that are exceptional, they can find people that are falling behind, and they can, they're actually trying to push more people into the middle of the people that are doing exactly what they want. Um, this hierarchical system authority and supervision is being imposed in which student performance and teacher scores are easily measured. Okay, they're, almost, they're increasingly visible. We're publishing the scores. Um, they're immediately available because of their online nature. And they're neatly individualized in order to facilitate convenient stigmatization. And that's a big deal. You can, go, you can actually go and find out a teacher's score, how, the, how teachers are doing with respect to each other. So they've set up this, this ability for teachers to sort of self-police themselves. They, they need to conform because they're in competition with their peers. Um, over time, this kind of managerial framework removes from the system those that fall outside the assessment established norms, thereby ensuring total compliance. So what, what that means is, okay, if, if you don't get a good value-added measure score, we're gonna let you go. So we may hire some new people in, but pretty soon all we have are people that get good value-added measure scores, people that comply to exactly what we want. So we're gonna get the same, over time, you're gonna get the same teachers. Um, I want you to think about this also in terms of non-public schools that are, that are under Common Core assessments, typically ones that take vouchers, because they, they have to give Common Core assessments. Those schools also um, are subject to these grades, and they're also subject to having to conform in order to meet those, because under the accountability laws, they will be shut down if they don't meet it. And for instance, in Milwaukee Archdiocese, for instance, everyone wonders why the Milwaukee Archdiocese wouldn't come out against Common Core. Well, this is a, this is a fact about the Milwaukee Archdiocese of the downtown Milwaukee Catholic schools. 50% of them have over 90% of their students receiving vouchers. 
So if, if they wouldn't teach their children to the common core, and knowing they have to take the smarter balanced assessments, they can't risk having a, num a number of those students fail. If, if they lose the ability to take vouchers, you're gonna see half the Catholic schools in downtown Milwaukee close. They'll lose 90% of their money. So this is a direct control by the state over Catholic schools in Milwaukee. Common Core provides a fine-grained control over both the labor, it controls the teachers, and the raw materials, which are students involved in the education process. Students can be easily tracked and managed, while teachers can be ranked, sorted, and rewarded in discipline, all in real time. This can happen on a daily basis. In fact, a lot of schools and larger districts are already having daily meetings, figuring out which teachers are falling behind, which teachers are, are doing well, and uh, and dealing with that either with rewards or discipline. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna just sort of summarize this. I wanna talk about objectification that happens here. It kind of, you kind of feel like an object when you're just given a letter grade and it's applied to you, like, or either as a school or a teacher. Um, but um, one of the things that Common Core has, and I guess underlying the assumption, is that um, it's fair that it, a student can be assessed universally, fairly, and objectively across differing populations and in differing contexts. Now that demands a decontextualization, meaning that it kind of takes the student, it assumes that a student in inner city Chicago is the same as a student in rural Nebraska, is the same as a student in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, it takes them out of their element and denies the existence of re very real differences in their life. Um, it embraces a fundamental assumption that a student is a student is a student, and how well any student does rests solely on how hard the student tries and how much value is added by the teacher, that there aren't anything else, that it doesn't matter whether that student had breakfast that morning, whether that student's parents are drug users, whether that student's um, parents are having a divorce, etc. We're all snowflakes though, right? Um, we're diverse. And the problem is that students and teachers are in fact unique individuals with widely varying interests and talents and challenges. They exist within context, they have personal lives, familial relationships, local and regional differences and beyond, and that impacts their individual perspective, comprehension, passions, affinities, approaches, and many other aspects of their personhood. Reducing students to a single score on a common core assessment objectifies those students. Um, reducing teachers to a number based on their students' performance objectifies the teachers. And um, grading schools based largely on standardized assessments potentially objectifies entire communities despite their rich history and um, diverse populations. Um, longitudinal data systems are directly analogous to these business computer systems I was talking to about early, earlier at Walmart and at uh, Amazon. Um, they track student progress on Common Core assessments, provide quality control on the raw material refinement process. Um, and what's the only difference? Well, the difference is that we're not dealing with raw materials like you would in a factory. We're dealing with our children. Our children have been depersonalized and be re been reduced to a set of data points. Um, and they're manipulated via, via standard processes to produce the desired outcomes. I want to talk a little bit about some of the money behind this. Um, this is a Led Zeppelin, <laughs> Led Zeppelin uh, lyric um, that basically says that the piper, uh, uh, when you pay the piper, you get to call the tune. And here's an analogous quote, for, uh, quote from Bill Gates. Um, if you have 50 different plug types, appliances would be available that would be very expensive. But once an electric outlet becomes standardized, Many companies can design appliances and competition ensues, creating a variety of better prices for consumers. Um, I, think, <laughs> I think he's talking about schools being that way, but uh, if you think about the plugs as our children, um, I don't think we all really would want our children to all be identical and the same. Um, many, one of the things that, I wanna talk a little bit about jobs of the future. Um, most states were seduced into adopting the Common Core, well, a couple ways. They were pressured with some monetary type things. But the real hard sell came on saying, uh, we want to provide STEM jobs, and that's uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics jobs, uh, 
and increase those in your state. And, and this will do it, they said. Um, it'll improve uh, flow through the critical stem pipeline. That was actually in most of the Common Core sales material. Um, Christopher Tinken um, is a researcher, um, has shattered that claim. He's shown that more researchers and scientists and qualified engineers than our economy can employ has um, that, our, that the United States already has more researchers, scientists, and engineers than our economy can employ right now, even more in the pipeline, and is one of the most economically competitive nations on the globe, that there, we, there actually is not a shortage of these STEM workers, and it's a false thing to lead parents to believe that, that, that getting their children into these science jobs is going to necessarily ensure them work in the future. That's not to say that if your child loves this, that they shouldn't go into it. You know, I think any child should go and pursue their dreams. But it's, it's not something to push someone into because there's, there's going to be a glut of these jobs. And what's also, the, there's sort of the false notion they give parents that, that their child's going to be a research scientist, when in fact, a lot, many, many of these jobs are pipetting stuff from one test tube into another <laughs> all day. Okay. So there's... When you look at some of these companies behind Common Core, and I'm sure you've seen a number of these presentations now, they'll talk about Pearson being behind it and Microsoft being behind it, and it's fairly clear where that, why that's happening. Pearson creates textbooks, they create the tests, they make money on this whole cycle. Okay, they sell textbooks, they sell tests, they change the tests, they print new textbooks, they sell them, and they keep, it's like a money machine. Okay, Microsoft as well. Um, they keep selling educational software, and they're invested heavily in a lot of companies that that, that help teachers or, or do educational and online things with education. So I'm not going to get into that so much. That part's clear. But you also see a lot of other donors. When you look at the, the donors behind Common Core, you do see um, the Walton Foundation. Waltons are behind Walmart. The Jeff Bezos Foundation behind Amazon. You see State Farm, Prudential, um, Boeing. And you wonder, what do these people have to do? What, are they, what kind of money are they making? Um, and what I'm positing is that these Common Core advocates are more interested in what schools produce than in profiting directly from the Common Core realignment, like Amazon and Pearson are. So the Walton Family Foundation and Bezos Family Foundation have provided major support for Education Reform Now, Teach for America, Knowledge is Power program, each of which support Common Core standards, high-stakes standardized testing, and VAM-type uh, accountability measures. Um, in so doing, and keeping with the Taylorist approach, like I've told you, like they, like they do at Amazon and Walmart, um, they facilitate surveillance and foster the students' acceptance of it, all while objectifying the students and equating them with their ass assessment scores. So what I'm saying is that they're interested in the kinds of students we produce, not what they know. They're not interested in how smart the students are we produce. They're interested in what the students we produce are willing to put up with. Many of you uh, have heard of this report uh, promoting grit, tenacity, and perseverance, critical factors for success in the 21st century. Most of you probably know it because of the sort of outlandish devices that are in it of like monitoring uh, type mice that do heartbeats and facial recognition software and trying to measure stress. I'm not going to talk about that so much, but I'm going to talk about this because it makes a lot of mention that in the future, the Department of Education believes that one of the biggest challenges our children will have is how to persevere in the face of boredom. It says, students can develop psychological resources that promote grit, tenacity, and perseverance, including effortful control, in which students are constantly faced with tasks that are important for long-term goals, but that in the short term may not really feel desirable or intrinsically motivating. Successful students by themselves or with the support of others, marshal willpower and regulate their attention in the face of distractions. There's another document put out and funded by um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, $10 million study, that says that it wants to reori reorienting accountability arrangements around longitudinal data acknowledges that developing productive citizens is a core goal of all levels of education. While workforce development is not the only goal of education, it is one that is most systematically measurable through existing data collection activities undertaken by the state and federal agencies responsible for labor market information. So, 
Um, I kind of find this, this term's being used a lot lately instead of human resources, especially when it's used at the state level for these cross-company type databases, and that is human capital. I find it kind of an offensive term. Because it, makes us, it treats us all like willing cattle. Um, so today, employees are increase, employers are increasingly seeking employees who are willing to be surveilled and controlled via this computer business system type software, similar to the kind at Amazon and Walmart, but really in use in use at all major companies. Um, grit, tenacity, and perseverance, that, that document says that such non-cognitive skills, um, like persevering in the face of boredom, can be measured, recorded, and developed across the board in research practice, policy, industry, and popular culture. There is an emerging and convergent recognition that non-cognitive factors, particularly grit, tenacity, and perseverance, must play an essential role in evolving educational priorities. Now, how's this being done? It's being done on a couple levels. First, our children are being tested themselves all the time. Okay, there's formative tests on a daily basis. There's summative tests that they're preparing for and then taking. They themselves are experienced and that they are required to be tested constantly. But more than that, they're seeing what is a traditional role model for them, their teacher. Probably second, probably only to, to parents. And I, probably if the state has anything to do with it, um, probably primary, <laughs> um, they're seeing their teacher um, constantly being subjected to these same kind of things. They're, they've, they watch their teachers persevere in presenting scripted curriculum, um, continuing ever onward despite relentless surveillance and ranking. They may hear that their teacher is not ranking well and they all need to try harder. This happens. I, don't, I mean, I don't know if it happens in Wisconsin, but I've seen stories in like Atlanta that this happens. Um, Stories about, um, they see how desperate their teachers are that they do well on the tests for the school, you know, putting the weight of the school district or that teacher's future in their hands. And they get, and they get nervous about it. Um, this modeling teaches that constant modeling is normal in school, in the workplace, and in society, and is to be tolerated at, at increasingly invasive levels. Students learn that the purpose of this accountability, the shaping of their very lives and future, is acceptable. The jobs of the future share one thing in common. Um, they'll all come with an unprecedented amount of monitoring and control. Unless you're gonna work for a mom and pop store or be an entrepreneur, you're probably gonna be monitored. Even me, as a, I'm a programmer, my efficiency is monitored. There's all kinds of metrics they apply to code, and there is rankings. I mean, so it happens. Um, nearly all jobs can and will be subject to re-engineering by scientific management methods. Common Core requires that children develop deep perseverance skills so that they can combat the stress and boredom that they'll surely be required by work roles, be required, that will surely be required by work roles, defined by experts, and controlled even more by computers. So, Right now, there's middle managers that are kind of enforcing this, but those middle managers are also being replaced by computers that can make decisions for them, okay? So more and more, it's, not, it's completely impersonal. You're gonna start seeing that, I think, with the Common Core as they start having these large data sets to mine. They're gonna start making decisions about teachers in a completely non-personal level. They're gonna just look at scores, and that's gonna be the way it is. If you don't make, cut the mustard, you're out of here. Yeah. I brought with me a statement that I just received this week from the U.S. Department of Education. We're in a basement. Let me just read this quickly on that point. Um, Secretary of Education will amend the regulations governing the um, governing Title I, Part A of Elementary Secondary Education of 1965. As amended, um, they will phase out the authority of states to define modified academic achievement standards. So That's then, right. getting back to the point, um, we won't need much of a DPI pretty soon. It's going to That's be, right. be the federal government. Well, increasingly DPI in almost all states is simply is an arm of the Department of Education. It simply enforces what they want on the states. Um, 
and I know we have an elected person at the top of it, but the whole agency pretty much runs that way, and he just oversees it. Um, this, the ESEA, which that Ed talks about, has been used since 1965 as a way for the federal government to essentially control what states do. Even though states, under the Constitution, have a complete right to do education whichever way they want, here in Wisconsin, there is a Wisconsin constitutional right to a public education, but in many states, there's not a constitutional right to an education. It is a privilege in, in many states. Um, but nonetheless, the money tied to that, the strings tied to the ESEA, which is the funding that we get from the federal government, is what they used to control everything. And they used it to do, No Child Left Behind was an ESEA. Uh, Race to the Top is an ESEA legislation. Um, from a couple years ago. And this one as well is basically saying, well, we told you it was a state-led initiative to do Common Core. Um, even though it, we didn't think it would be, it turned out it was, and it turned out a lot of people didn't like it. So now, guess what? It's a national-led uh, thing, and we're gonna tie your money to it. And if you like that money, you better turn over the control. So what this basically comes down to is, what does being a human being mean uh, in this brave new world? Um, should we be managed through the careful construction of a system that alternately makes us slaves to reward and punish? Or should human beings be free to determine their own way forward based on individual interests, skills, and hard work? What's the role of leadership? Is it to design efficient systems, monitor outcomes, and reward success? Or is it to inspire and enable us, setting us free to fulfill our individual potential? Our government and industry leaders clearly would prefer that we choose a path where smart systems can monitor and control us as dumb humans. So what I'm, I'm here to sort of ask you to do today is to take a stand. Um, whether surveillance and control are exercised in the name of streamlined education, which is the sales pitch you get from DPI, corporate efficiency, which is what you get from Microsoft or any of these companies, Chamber of Commerce, that's pushing this, or a better society, which is what you often hear from on the left. Um, they want a kinder and, and, and more, more liberal tolerant. society, more tolerant society. Um, regardless why this is being done, we need to know if we can find the will to make an effective stand together against our own subjugation. Because that's what this really is. You're seeing all kinds of things happening. I know people are here are probably concerned about the immigration things that are happening right now. You're seeing you know, health care. You're seeing all this. But this, this is the reason so many of us in the state and across the country are really talking about Common Core still. We're still beating the drum a year or two later. Because this is the last stand. This is the one where they lock it in. Okay, all these other things could be moved back if people could, could learn and remember, remember what it's like to be free. I don't remember. I remember my grandparents telling me what it was like. But my kids, I'm not sure they will. Their kids, I highly doubt it if this goes through. They'll be taught from, from the time they're young all the way through college and career that they're not free, that they're being watched, that they're being controlled, that that's the way it's supposed to be. And when you stop knowing that you're in chains, that's when they really got you. That's what we're on the way to, and that's why we need to, in this session, talk to our legislatures. They need to pull back on Common Core. And frankly, given what Ed said, they need to push back against the federal government. I would call on someone like Scott Walker to say, no, we're not going to do it. Our legislature should back it up. I know the people in the legislature don't like to, to hear this word. It bugs them. But they need to seriously look at nullifying this law or this, this regulation to tell the federal government, forget it, not here in Wisconsin. Um, with that, I don't know if I have time, David, or yeah, yeah, yeah. if there's any questions, I'd be happy to... Very interesting. Yes, Gus. Um, could you talk for a minute about vouchers? Yeah. Because I was like, oh, this form, and then all of a sudden I got the email from you and Kirsten. I'm like, wait, think about it a little bit okay. deeper. These are actually kind of not what we think. Yeah, I, I want to 
This is something a lot of us have given a lot of thought to, and it, it's a popular thing. You know, this is a touchy subject, especially in Republican-ish circles. Um, vouchers are a way that can give kids, especially in poor districts, a way out. Okay, that, that there's a Catholic school down the block that they can't afford to, to go to. They can maybe out, opt out of going to their public school and go to the Catholic school. Or, I mean, I went to Wisconsin Lutheran High School in Milwaukee, and they take vouchers now, too. Same thing. Um, I, and I know there's some people that get vouchers that are probably not poor, that are just, it ends up being kind of just a break. I mean, which are, is welcome. It's welcome to get a $4,000 break to send your kid to a private school. But I'm just asking that people sort of step back and see what that does to schools over time. Because I've seen what it, I've, I've saw what it does to Wisconsin Lutheran High School, where I went. It was a very strict Lutheran High School, not a lot of drug problems, not a lot of gang problems and that kind of thing. And this was, this was 30 years ago. <laughs> so um, Today, they've, they've been taking vouchers for about 20 years. They're in the Milwaukee area. They're in Wauwatosa. Um, today, they've got a much bigger high school, a, a beautiful facility. They've got a football field. They've, it, they've done well with the voucher system. Um, but they have all these problems now. And, and I'm not just, that could be chalked up and some people might say, well, you're just saying that if they bring in these poor inner city kids that that's going to cause problems and that's racist or something like that. That may be, but that's one thing, that's one thing that's, that, ha that is happening there. The other thing that's happening now is that these tests are essentially, um, since they're bringing in poor kids the state's requiring them to give those kids these common core assessments and then grading them based on that. Now, the school has to ask itself, well, should we just, we're only required to test the kids that are on vouchers. But if we do that and they don't do as well as their peers in other schools, we could lose our ability to take vouchers. And right now they've kind of got used to the money coming in. So most schools actually choose to test their entire student population with Common Core tests. And what does that mean? Well, that means now, if you have this enforcement mechanism of the tests, you need to have your students' curriculum aligned to those tests if they're expected to do well. Because there are certain things in these tests that if you're not taught the Common Core way, they're gonna be foreign to you. Some of the ways you do mathematics are just different than other curriculums, okay? And I know, I mean, I teach that. I actually do seminars like in DeForest where I'm from. I have, they're well attended by parents because they're essentially for parents. Here's an hour course on how to help your kid with Common Core math. And it's not really judgmental. It's just here's how you add, here's how you multiply, you know. But I just wanna, so what's happening is, what happens is that these private schools, just through taking this money, just being what seems a fairly reasonable requirement to just test the kids who you get money for, now it gets bigger and bigger, and pretty soon, they've now changed the curriculum for their whole student body to conform to what the state wants. So now you have a private school essentially conforming the majority of its curriculum to the state. Now what happens over time? Now if your kid, if your kid has to get out of a high school in the inner city with gang problems and for four years goes to this other high school that's better, they're probably fine. But what happens over time to these high schools is they become more and more like what? they become more and more like the public school. So pretty soon, even though we like to call these choice programs or choice schools, what's really happening is they're taking away your choice. Over time, all your choices dry up. The only choices we really have are the schools that accept public money and the schools that don't. And those are probably really expensive. So what, what's happening is our choices are being taken away. Um, over long periods of time. See, we do it slowly so nobody notices. Right, and, and as part of Wisconsin's adoption of the Common Core, and this is true in almost all the states, the public universities had to agree that to reorient what they used to call remedial classes as, as not remedial classes anymore. So what you're starting to see is that students are being let in with lower, lower requirements. You may have seen that the requirements of Common Core are really a, a, for tech school. They're not really for a 
a college, like a higher education college like UW. Um, and then they're also dumbing down the graduation requirements for college. But you're right, uh, essentially what's happening, are, this is also a means of control. They're requiring more and more kids to go to college just to get what they should have got in high school. Okay, Spend longer and longer in college to get to where the college wants them to go and causing them to do what? Rack up more and more debt, which they're responsible to the government for, and then they got them. Okay. I, I do know that Milwaukee Archdiocese is still on board with it, and the Wisconsin Lutheran Synod is still on board with it. So those are the only two that I know for sure are. Steve, maybe you'd be the last the, one. This common core standard for the European countries and the foreign countries is laughing at us? No, they're doing the same thing. Um, this is, and we don't like to talk about this, I don't like to talk because as soon as I bring this up, people ask me to bring out my tinfoil hat, but, um, <laughs> but this whole effort, and, and up to and including even the money behind, with the, the Gates Foundation has behind it, they've spent about a billion dollars in America, um, they've spent about three billion dollars worldwide to fund a UNESCO program called Education for All, uh, and if you look at the Common Core documents, you see a lot of the language in the Common Core documents actually taken from the UNESCO documents. Now I'm not saying, I want to make it clear, I'm not saying that there's someone up at the UN pulling strings, making Arnie Duncan jump and Obama jump doing this. But what it is, is it's sort of, uh, they get their material all from a common source and it's sort of the same themes are running. They're doing the same thing in the uh, European Union and in England, doing the same things in India. Frankly, they're doing the same things in China. So. Um, I'm sorry. Is funding for lunch programs? Yeah. Does that, um, like the Catholic or parochial schools? I don't. I don't think that the lunch programs have anything. If they get lunch, just lunch program money, I don't think that requires that they take Common Core tests. It, right now, it's for all I know, it's it's tied to taking um, school choice money, the voucher program, and that's it. We're going to have to stop it here because yeah. we're already five, six after, and Jeff's not going to run away immediately. So no. I hope you'll come and ask him some questions. I want to ask him some questions too, but okay. we got to we got to get done here, unfortunately. So thank you very much, Jeff. Okay, thanks. Can I just give a brief commercial about the book and why this book, as opposed to other Common Core books, is useful to you? Um, this book is the title is. Um, common Ground and Common Core, core not Corn, uh, Voices from Across the Political Spectrum Expose the Realities of Common Core State Standards. It's a very interesting book because there are radical leftists in here who have written articles. There are libertarians, there are activists, there are parents, there are, it, it covers everything. So what you, what's nice about this book is that you can take this home and look at all the neighbors on each side of your house and not be afraid to lend this to them and let them read it. They will find something in, in here that will touch them somehow and convince them. Um, and, and even the, the articles that are not from your part of the political spectrum have been at least put in the uh, non-high rhetoric language so that you are at least capable of reading it, trying to understand what the author is saying without being turned off. So there's no talk about Koch brothers, and there's no talk about Obama and how evil he is. There's none of that in here. Extreme is not in that book. Yes, there's, not, there's like some extreme ideas, but they're all presented in a way that you can really share these with your neighbors. So that's what makes this different than any book. So actually, what I suggest, that is that we, if you're trying to raise this, don't send it just to the Republican legislators. All of them need a copy. The trigger so. words have been removed, I guess. Huh? Yep. Thank you.